<coughs> could do this. These are some other examples of the specifications. You should know what your specifications are and you should have your specifications written out and available for your design reviewers and you should flash a couple slides in your design review to say here's what we're doing, here are requirements and then you dive into the part that you want reviewed because they will ask. Okay? Um, when you've got your specification, your, your project partner and your advisor, they've identified that we've got the right need, there's not a commercially viable solution, um, and we believe that we can meet those specifications. The next phase in the design process, now let me, let me go back here. Is it okay in my specification for me to be designing prototypes already? Because the next phase is conceptual design when we're thinking about how to do it. It's a little bit of a trick question. When I come up with my idea, <coughs> it is natural as soon as you hear about the problem, you come up with an idea. Here's my idea. I love my idea. It's like kind of perfect. It's smaller than last week's idea because I had a water bottle. <laughs> now I've just got my little um, remote clicker thing. But it's okay to say I might have had prototypes. I think I mentioned, did I mention last week about the teacher that we forgot, we didn't have storage? So that's the thing, as I'm writing my requirements, I might have things like, oh, we're just going to take a box, tell me about how you would use it. We want to make sure we have all the requirements. We might have come up with some kind of prototype that we think might actually look like this, but I'm not trying to solve the problem yet, I'm just trying to get requirements. So I'm going to take my idea and I'm going to set it over there. So I come into this knowing that everybody in my design team already has ideas. You know, we can pretend it's like, don't taint yourself, which just isn't true. It's human nature. It's like, oh, I already got ideas. And it's human nature to think, I'm in love with the ideas. The problem is, here's me, or you, and I'm thinking of this idea, and I have my idea. And it's a wonderful idea. And I love my idea. I'm going to convince my whole design team that it's the best. What scares me, for you all career-wise, is you have somebody in some other country, or it could be in this country, working for a competitor, comes up with another idea, and this is a better idea. But I've explored lots of ideas. It's over in this space, but this idea isn't in the space I'm considering. They're going to put me out of business. What I need to do is to make sure that the spaces that I examine, the ideas I have, have my beautiful, practically perfect idea that's wonderful here and that other stupid idea that's for some reason is better. <laughs> Does that make sense? So I've got them. I just need to be able to set them aside, accumulate others, and we're going to evaluate them. Um, one of the ways to do this <coughs> is what's called a functional decomposition. If you're in mechanical engineering, when you're a sophomore, you'll go through this. It's looking at what the thing needs to do. And one of the techniques in a functional decomposition is you look at the different things it needs to do and get down to the most specific things. An exercise that we do when we do this <coughs> is like a mechanical pencil. And you look at the things the mechanical pencil needs to do. Basically, it needs to write, right? But you say, oh, it actually needs to like hold lead. It needs to store lead. How do I get, it needs to transfer the lead from the storage to where I'm going to hold it. There are a lot of different things it needs to do. You just think about how you advance lead. There's, you know, the clicker at the end. There's a clicker on the side, some twists. So there are different ways to do that. When I'm coming up with my idea, 
I can come back and our team can brainstorm on each of these individual ideas. What we tend to do is brainstorm on the whole thing. I want to solve the whole thing. Now it's my idea versus yours. But actually my idea might have different parts, but I'm not going to get into an argument there. We're going to start to look at how each of these can work. And that's a technique that can be effective. In brainstorming, when you come in, um, how many of you have ever participated in a brainstorming activity? Not many, or those of you that did aren't very proud of it. <laughs> like, kinda, nobody else. The idea in brainstorming is you try to stimulate your brain. We tend to only use certain parts of our brain. People that do brainstorming, like research on this, They'll say when you're brainstorming, the best ideas often come after some of the stupidest ideas. Why would that be? You get the stupid out of your system and now I'm revived? Well, what it, what it is is here's the idea. I've got this in my mind and I'm kind of thinking on this. And then somebody says something out, way out in left field. Like, well, that's not relevant. When you're brainstorming, one of the rules is you don't criticize any ideas because you want these crazy ideas. Because what it does, it physiologically activates a different part of your brain. And now you're like, okay, that's not relevant. Now let's get back to task. Your brain will now activate other neurons coming back on. And when it activates those, it can trigger other things. You ever come out of a test and somebody says something, you're like, oh, that's the answer. Yep. Yeah, it used to happen to me a lot. Like, oh, if I just had two days on every exam, I would have had a much higher grade point. <laughs> what it does is you're thinking about it and your brain couldn't find that memory. But your brain activated something else and as it was cruising through, it activated those neurons. You're like, oh, you were looking for this a while ago. <laughs> That's what that, all right. So there are different ways that you can do brainstorming. When people are out of ideas, you can look at things like, could you use things different ways? One of the questions I love is like, well, how would nature solve this? How many have you ever seen an animal with a wheel? <laughs> yeah, you know, they were looking at like robotics and stuff, like how do we get things into dangerous situations and they're making like tank-like things and somebody says, how's nature? It's like there are all kinds of things that crawl over rocks and stuff and none of them have wheels. So they started looking at robotic things that look like um, animals and stuff. Looking at other, th other mechanisms that um, you can use in different ways. Looking at existing product projects. <coughs> when you're in conceptual design, you're trying to, just like that um, graphic that I showed you with the two ideas, you're trying to get lots of ideas out and then what we're going to do is narrow them. We want to do things systematically in design. So a decision matrix is a way to come up with these different ideas and systematically evaluate them. You make a table, and the idea in the table is you've got criteria, you've got weights, and then you've got ideas that you're going to compare. This is an example of like, oh, I've got so many job offers, I need to weigh them. I'm going to use a decision matrix. What? It could happen. <laughs> so I want to think of what's important and I can put weights. Now, there's not a magic way to do this. This just uses like a five. Like where I live is much more important than who I work for. <coughs> and money's kind of important, but not as much as getting out of the state of Indiana. <laughs> um, then. <laughs> Shh, I have four kids, I get it. Um, so what you can do is look at the different companies and score them how well they do. Then what I do is I take my weight, I multiply it by the number, and I add up the, the, weighted, uh, the weighted scores. Now when you do this, is this statistically significant here? No, because I got numbers, that's good. 
but I kind of use a four, a five. Is this a three or a four? It's a little bit of a judgment call. What it does, though, if I got something that's 70 and I got something else that's 20, this 70's better. During design, always use your brain. Okay? Use your common sense. Take a step back and say, does this make sense to us? Like, wow, we thought, you know, this one was going to be better. Why isn't it? You can look at that and go, oh, now that we looked at it, we were kind of biased to this way. Or you could look at it to say, you know what, we're missing something. We, we actually think this one's better because in the way that, that we evaluated it. So anytime you're making these decisions, you want to come back and say, does this make sense? This is a great thing to put up under your design reviews as far as this is our decision process. Here's how we made the de decision. So now we've got our idea and we're going to make the detailed part happen. One of the things that I say in here, if it's a larger project, <coughs> when we would work on really big projects, you'd look at your interfaces. Like we've got a general idea, but now we actually got to make it work. So you're working on one part, I'm working on another. If it's a code, we're going to agree on what variables we're going to pass back and forth. And then you're going to write your part, I'm going to write mine. If it's an electronics part, we may say, OK, they're going to get connected. Let's talk about our connector, how many pins we're going to have. If it's a mechanical thing, when we used to work on like engines, the first drawings were just where the, different pe where the turbine and compressor and combustor met. How big a round? How many bolts are going to go in? And then we would go off and design our own pieces. So what decisions do we have to make? Now when you do that, you're making a commitment that, OK, my part's going to fit in the box this size. I may come back like, ah, I can't. Then you got to go back. So you're trying to make as good a decisions as you can, but to allow other people um, to work. <coughs> Failure mode and effects analysis is, is a tool. And we're going to put together a, a module actually on this, is looking at ways to say, now you've got your idea. What could go wrong? And a DFMEA is a systematic way to identify. You brainstorm failures, and then you look at them based on the severity. How severe are things? Is it going to hurt, kill anybody? How frequently will it occur? And how likely is it that we can detect it before it fails? In a DFMEA, you score each of these out of 10, and you end up with a number. But it's a way to rank potential things that can go wrong. And then make a decision. Now, as a design team, how many of you think that you drive a car where the design team eliminated every possible failure mode. That's good. Because there, as, a design, as a designer, you may say, OK, there are things that can go wrong. How many of these do we have to eliminate, and what can we tolerate? There's not a precise thing. But that's the kind of conversation that um, you end up with. Then we can do user testing. Um, couple final things. When we're thinking of design, you want to think of things in terms of who can use this. We had a team, <coughs> they were doing their specification. And they said, oh, it's got to be portable. And I said, define that. And they came up with a weight. I said, how'd you come up with that weight? Well, we, did, we got some ergonomic data from the federal government. I said, OK, that's good. And so we've designed this so 50% of the people can lift this. And then I got kind of frustrated. What percent of the population cannot use our product? 50%. I thought that was a little high, especially since all the teachers that were going to use it were female. And they use strength data for men and women. So more than 50% of our teachers couldn't use it. When you're you looking at things, you want to look at, are we making decisions that might exclude people? 
Um, are there things that we can do to make things more inclusive for more, uh, for more people? This is one of the things when you look at, at equity too. If, if you ever gone to, well, it's actually like this class. If I, if I used a wheelchair, where would I be sitting? What if I didn't want that? What if I'm kind of a left side of the room type person? Now I'm stuck. Right? This is a camp, Camp Riley. Anybody on a Camp Riley team? Anybody proud of it? Okay, I see a few people. I'm not going to call on you. This is down at Camp Riley. What they did is they have an audit, um, a performance area that's totally accessible. So they have campers with different types of disabilities. Some people use wheelchairs. The standard thing, every seat's accessible. They just fold the seats up. So if I'm there with somebody with a wheelchair, they can sit anywhere, and I can too. I just fold the seat down. So I said, we're not just going to have people sit over there to segregate. Can, we act, can I actually design things that are more accessible? Or, or equitable? Are they flexible in use? Can they be used for, for different things? Are they simple and intuitive? <coughs> I love people saying, well, it's obvious. Yeah, if you were the engineer that wrote the instructions. <laughs> Why does it have to be labeled push? Yeah, because you've got a pull handle on that. Yeah. OK. I, uh, this is just an example. If you look at, here's the stove. Okay, which handle goes to which? Do you see how this one's more intuitive? Like the handle's next? Okay. Um, different ways to communicate your information. You know the crosswalks out here, they have visual clues. They also have auditory that count down. Uh, what happens if there's an error? Hopefully somebody doesn't die. Um, can I prevent something that, that's not, can I connect something that incorrectly? Or is it going to give me an error? Standardize. Is the red light always at the top in the US? Yes. Yeah, except yes. for the weird cities yeah. that have them horizontal. Right, no, but there's, um, so if I'm colorblind, coming in here. All right. Um, if I'm, if I'm looking at size, this is a thing that we would get into our designs. Like, yes, if I was really long and over six foot, I could actually reach this thing. Can I, there are, um, there's data out here. I'm trying to get to the last. There, these come from <coughs> their government websites and other people that have looked at pieces. I want to come up. Three final things. Delivery phase is the last phase. We have it done. We're expected to actually deliver to the, the user. When you get to the delivery phase, this is important, there are forms that need to be signed off, and you need to have EPIC's approval before they go off. They go off site. And we are responsible for the maintenance to some degree, once it goes off, and you want to make sure in the delivery process that, that we've completed um, that. By next lecture, this will get mailed out. There's an ethics survey we want you to take. Doesn't take very long. It takes like 20 minutes. You want your, uh, where's my, TAs in the back for the attendance form. Name, ID, true to number one. Um, let me, hang on, I'll go get in the back over here or the TA's over there for the attendance forms. Or I can grab them on my way up. So, not for you.